Hi Rail Lovers! We believe that most of you have already heard about China's exceptional achievements in the field of railways. This is maybe the most obvious in the case of construction of high-speed rail network. Accordingly, we decided to make a video about how China managed to construct 36,000 km of brand new high-speed railway lines. All of that in less than 12 years. We would like to remind you that in 2008, China had only one such line, only 117 km long. Welcome to Railways Explained, this is the story about Chinese high-speed miracle. Let's start from the beginning. Every great idea or change starts with a plan. A key moment for Chinese railway development was the adoption of a so-called medium and long-term railway plan back in 2004. This plan concerned the vision of domestic freight and passenger railway network in 2020. It was implemented through a series of five-year railway development plans setting out priority projects for each of five-year cycles. All five-year plans are consistent with MLTRP, while at the same time they ensure coordination of the national railway development with the development of other sectors of economy, social development and whole transportation system. At the time of the adoption of MLTRP, freight volumes in China were growing rapidly. Eventually, this started straining the network capacity. On the other side, the growth of the cities and booming economy and living standard contributed to significant demands for passenger transport. However, low speeds on the existing lines to a large scale limited competitiveness. So the China simply came out with a plan in which it is stated that the national railway infrastructure must grow to 100,000 km by 2020, out of which 12,000 km would be exclusively used by high-speed trains. The plan also envisaged that these high-speed passenger dedicated lines should form four horizontal and four vertical corridors, thus linking all major cities. Except for the hangzhou shenzhen corridor, all are parallel to the existing conventional lines, which all were either at or approaching the point of full capacity. The idea was to substitute long-distance passenger traffic with the new services, leaving only a limited number of local services on the existing lines. In that way, sufficient capacity for freight services would be secured. Then, in 2016, MLTRP has been revised in order to be expanded until 2025. As the benefits of high-speed services became obvious, this revised plan changed the idea of network structure from 4 vertical and 4 horizontal to 8 vertical and 8 horizontal corridors. All of them are of course supplemented by even more regional and intercity railway links. In that way, the previous 2020 target for railway network became 150,000 km including 30,000 km of high-speed lines, constructed in such a way that over 80% of all large and medium-sized Chinese cities would have access to high-speed services. What is even more interesting, this plan was achieved in defined deadline. However, for 2025, the plan is to reach 175,000 km including 38,000 km for high-speed lines. In that way, high-speed network will connect almost all large and medium-sized cities, which is, for a country like China, almost unbelievable. Imagine a country as big as the whole Europe, having the travel times of 1 to 4 hours between the cities larger than half a million residents and 30 minutes to 2 hours between all the regional centers. Can you even imagine what this means for the economy and the development of one country? We'll come to that later. Now, look at this picture. This is the map of Chinese high-speed rail network in 2008. This is the same thing five years later in 2013. This is 2017. And this is the map from February this year. Now, let's stick to this map for a while. There are three general types of high-speed rail lines in China. The so-called trunk lines, which are dedicated passenger lines designed for maximum speeds of 350 km per hour. 
The secondary main lines and regional connections are designed for maximum speeds of 250 km per hour. And the last but not least, there are other intercity lines designed for maximum speeds of 200 km per hour. Some of them are dedicated while others are being used by both the passenger and the express freight traffic. The high-speed supply chain usually has four main branches – construction, equipment manufacturing, technology research and operation management. In China's case, the pivotal role is played by complete and independent supply chain, but also the ability of China to perform all phases of the project independently, from design to operation. The size of high-speed network in China has provided a market large enough to support the full development of each of these branches. China has its own companies specialized in design, construction and survey, but also the companies in charge for manufacturing the trains, signaling safety devices and all other necessary equipment. We need to mention that the research relating to the high-speed technology also plays a significant role. In China's case, it is implemented on three different levels – through enterprises, scientific research institutes and colleges and universities. In some cases, the research and the development are integrated into the process of manufacturing. For example, many of the major railway research institutes are direct subsidiaries of China Railway Corporation. This practice enabled China to finally be able to possess its own technology after years of using and mimicking foreign solutions. In addition, prior to 2015, the realization of one project included developing of a pre-feasibility study. Since 2015, this process has been simplified and it now begins with feasibility study. Also, the timeline of planning, design and obtaining all the approvals usually take less than a year, which is amazing and we believe possible only in China. Furthermore, during 2007, the Chinese Ministry of Railways introduced the so-called standardized management of construction projects. The key principle of this management model is everything has a standard, everything has a process, everything has a responsible person. By introducing these standard procedures, China managed to save significant amounts of construction costs and more importantly the time, avoiding unnecessary repairs and the waste of resources. For lines capable of 350 km per hour, construction costs in China are at the average 20.6 million US dollars per kilometer of line and about 16.9 million for lines capable of 250 km per hour. Regarding the lines capable of 200 km per hour, the costs are about 15.4 million US dollars, which is at least 40% less compared to, for example, Europe. Although labor costs are indeed lower in China, this is not the main reason for Chinese efficiency. A key factor in the lower costs and the reason behind rapid and efficient high-speed construction in China is more likely to be the standardization of designs and procedures to the greatest possible extent. Since the opening of the first line in 2008, the total passenger rail volumes have grown at the rate of 8.5% each single year. As a result, China now produces four times more passenger kilometers than the whole European and Japanese high-speed rail networks. Also, high-speed services have major impact on domestic air traffic. Some short-distance air services have already been completely withdrawn, while others have discounted fares or even reduced their services. As an example, on the screen you can see the impact of high-speed rail traffic on the routes between Guangzhou and Changsha and between Guangzhou and Wuhan. In both cases, the drop of air services is significant, ranging from two-thirds to one-half of the previous volumes. Beside higher speeds, this effect is also related to high reliability of high-speed services, but also the fact that airports are often located far from the city center. For example, between Beijing and Nanjing, the high-speed travel time is 3.5 hours compared to 2 hours of flight. However, the Nanjing airport is 47 kilometers far from the city center, while the railway station is only 16 kilometers. 
when you take into account the time needed to reach the airport plus the airport procedures, railway traffic becomes quite competitive with air traffic. In addition, by introducing the network of high-speed rail services, many opportunities arose to connect previously disconnected cities using different combinations of lines. Also, each line creates additional flows for the other lines. For example, the chengzhou xian line, which was an isolated line until 2012, after it was connected to the beijing guangzhou high-speed line in 2013, the passenger volumes increased by 43%. This practically means that by constructing more lines, you make the existing ones even more profitable. From 2005 to 2020, estimation says that China spent more than a trillion US dollars for the construction of high-speed rail network. However, the profitability of high-speed services is quite a different story. Shortest possible answer these services, in most cases, generate heavy losses. Namely, only 5 out of 15 trunk lines manage to cover their operating and capital costs, while 6 are unable to pay the interest on their loans. The situation is even worse for secondary main lines and regional connections, which make up majority of high-speed traffic. Just 5 out of 16 are able to cover their operating and maintenance costs and none had the profits to pay back the interest, let alone debt principal. So, does this mean that China has lost its mind while constructing so many high-speed railway lines? Well, no. But the answer to that question requires in-depth analysis for which we do not have time in this video. Simply put, not everything lies in direct profitability. First, China, in most cases, is not even investing in those services to make them profitable. It is investing in mobility of its citizens and workforce, it is investing in changing the landscape of the whole country, and eventually it is investing in connecting the waste areas of the country into one single market. So, if you want to assess the profitability of one high-speed line, you need to take a deeper look into the benefits it makes for the whole economy. Second, the high-speed railways reduces congestion and helps China solve the space problem in overcrowded areas. Imagine being able to live 300 kilometers far from your job, yet being able to start every shift on time. Third, China makes significant profits by exporting technology, knowledge and experience gained during the construction of its high-speed network, especially within the framework of Belt and Road Initiative, which we explained in one of the previous videos. And finally, it is the question of political vision. China has the intention to prove itself as a socialist heaven, but it also wants to integrate some faraway regions, which might in addition have secessionist aspirations. However, this is not a simple question, yet we try to share our opinion. We might not know all the details and the numbers for sure, but most certainly, China has its own calculation. And just by looking into the plans for future, we all might assume that the net effect of Chinese efforts must be positive. Regarding the plans for future, or better said 2035, China plans to reach 200,000 km of railway network, including 70,000 km of high-speed lines. So, the next time someone says that China's efforts to construct so many high-speed lines are irrational or unprofitable, well, just show them this video. We hope that we managed in a straightforward and understandable manner to share with you some thoughts on why is China so good in constructing high-speed railway lines. Simply, it all started with the traffic needs and demands. In China's case, they were immediately recognized, assessed and embodied into strategic national development plans. Then, those plans have been implemented with significant dedication and with zero tolerance for deviation. This played significant, but not the crucial role. The two things that were indeed crucial are the standardization of procedures down to the smallest detail and closed independent circle of supply industry. However, there's something even more important something which was and continues to be the most important fuel behind Chinese achievements. Those are the vision and the political will. This was Rayleigh's explained. 
We hope you enjoyed and learned something new about the railways of the world. Goodbye.